Hi everyone, and uh, thanks for tuning in. Uh, I, I think it's, although it's designed as a course where each uh, lecture builds on the ones before, that, that's not actually a realistic assumption. I know we've got some very faithful people, including some here in the room, who have come to everyone. Uh, there will be some things that, you know, assume stuff done earlier on, but I'll, I'll try and explain that as I go. So let's already pass to the um, first uh, main slide. And just a reminder of what evolution is, it's de was de defined very simply as descent with modification. And one reason I'm putting that there is there are people who think it meant something else. That is, you often get rejections of so-called evolutionary approaches, especially in anthropology, I think, by people who thought that it involved some progressive uh, ascent towards perfection and was therefore you know, inherently racist to apply to, to languages that there would be you know, primitive languages and more sophisticated languages. That is no part of what was ever put forward as part of the theory of evolution uh, because the question is always good for what? And everything is in a different setting, in a different ecological niche. So what's good for one niche is not good for another. So that means that the modification that, that takes place is driven by something. Uh, there's an initial step at which modification can arise uh, through just imperfect copying, whether of genes or of forms that you hear from your parents or other uh, caregivers. Uh, but then, uh, in progress. then there's the modification at population level, uh, and then that requires selection. That is, why does a new variant uh, win out over an old uh, variant? So as we get different evolutionary pathways uh, in terms of language structure as we are here, that reflects what we could call different selector weightings. That is, you've got the things selecting, uh, and the claim uh, I'll be advancing today is that a lot of uh, linguistic diversification can be understood in this way. Uh, and uh, also interactions. So if, if in a complex system, when you put several selectors together, uh, these things can produce complex outcomes. Uh, and this can be amplified through iteration. Every language, except possibly totally new languages, like a new English mixed language, but the, most of the languages we deal with are the products of hundreds, thousands of generations. And that gives time for very small effects to accumulate. So it's helpful to distinguish internal selectors. This, this is a term I'm using, it's not a standard term, which are internal to the language system. Uh, and they would apply regardless of the population speaking the language or the culture in which it's spoken, its demography or whatever. Uh, so in both the functionalist literature on competing motivations, term uh, from Dubois, but used by many others, or trade-offs, and in optimality theory, competing rankings of constraints, uh, that will generate diversity in itself. So if you just think of a sort of baby example from sort of thing that's been widely discussed in optimality theory, you've got some different constraints such as ease of articulation, things are easier to pronounce. If you make them at the same point of articulation, and what that is called in optimality theory, faithfulness, that is you have an invariant form, so it's easier to learn. So you've got a cognitive constraint, keep the forms invariant. You've got a uh, articulatory constraint, smooth out your articulation. Those are playing off against one another. And you can see this just by comparing what happens in a couple of Romance languages and English. So I'll just choose the word. Um, which in English is unpronounceable, uh, with a change in point of articulation between the N and the P, so we don't say unpronounceable, uh, whereas both in Italian uh, and in French, Italian is a bit clearer because it's really about impronunciable, um, and French, imprononciable, you have a, a simulation. 
Okay? So in Italian and French, you've got at least the in and the im as variants. So you're violating faithfulness, uh, but you are favoring um, ease of articulation. In English, it's the other way. Right? You're keeping adhering to faithfulness, but you're um, making the ease of uh, making the articulation a little harder. So that's an example of the sort of thing that linguists have long seen as a source of linguistic variation, and I agree that it is. Uh, and I'm going to be giving an example from reciprocals, which shows you that you can indeed take it a long way. I don't want to deny that this is uh, a source of considerable diversity because languages are complex systems. But on the other hand, I think we also have to look at what are called what we can call external selectors, which appeal to factors outside the system itself. So my um, trajectory today will be, uh, first of all, to, um, well, we, we've already said this, that traditional linguistics, and I think that both generative approaches and linguistic typology have been equally guilty here. It's a sort of um, improbable alliance, if you like, has vastly underrated the role of external selectors. There's been a tendency among linguists just to do everything you want with respect to linguistic factors. Um, but what's become very interesting in recent years as we've had more access to computational modeling uh, and modeling of evolutionary pathways, we can see that really, really small selector biases can get amplified in a population over hundreds of generations to produce very different um, linguistic outcomes. So that you can have two populations which have a very small difference. It can be like a 1% difference in say a particular gene or frequency and, and run through time, this can produce a, a large difference in the optimally adapted language system spoken by that population. Uh, so I would say that today, in 21, compared to what we thought even 20 years ago, there's lots more external selectors that we have starting to get good evidence for. And I think that this is going to be a trajectory where we will get lots more to come. So just as an initial example where I think no one could reject this as an example, but also to show that um, there are complex feedback loops, if we think about the co-evolution of language, culture, and uh, biological factors, that is um, deafness. Uh, with regard to sign language, we can see a lot of different uh, scenarios. So we've got uh, relations of the social to the modality, uh, and um, deaf individuals play a central role here, but not the only role. So, uh, for example, if we look at sign languages in Central Australia and other parts of Australia, certainly they're used by deaf people, but they probably arose originally through hunting sign language, which is a partial sign language system for being silent while hunting, and that's found right across the continent. Uh, and then there was a cultural practice of uh, basically women's camps, but centered around widow's camps for groups like uh, Walbury, uh, but other women could be there as well. So women, you know, taking refuge from their husbands or whatever, and also deaf women. Now, there was a cultural practice that uh, you shouldn't speak during a period of mourning after your husband's death. So you would then use sign language even as a speaking person. So that meant that a proportion of the people in those widows' camps were hearing widows, but there were also deaf uh, people. So, so that's a particular matrix where, you know, while this sign language arose, it pro probably doesn't favour um, you know, a larger level of, of deafness in the population, although I don't know that that's been studied. Um, and then you can get... Uh, situations where do local population genetics can have um, effects. So um, in 
lots of small communities like villages, say in, in Bali, uh, this has been studied, where you get a um, higher proportion than usual of deaf people as a result of certain uh, mutations arising, but then social adaptation, so that, for example, certain roles in society, like fixing irrigation canals and so on, uh, go with being deaf. And because most families had deaf members of their families, almost every speaking person is also fully at home uh, with sign language. I, I didn't put the, this video up, but you can see very nice uh, videos of cut a lot of this um, deaf sign language in, in northern Bali, where you have two people conversing in sign language, and it's not a you can't tell just by looking at the video that one is a speaking person or a non-deaf person, and one is a deaf person. Um, I should also have mentioned that, that that's the top part here, that there are social conditions probably for the emergence of fully fledged sign languages. So if you have societies where deaf people are just sort of kept away from one another because they're stigmatized, uh, each deaf person or maybe each middle group has to invent its own system as a sort of home sign system, which probably doesn't attain full complexity. Whereas in other settings, like you know, the modern uh, deaf schools, uh, and in first in France and in the US and in elsewhere, but also in settings like the, the Ottoman court uh, from, I think, about the 15th century, 16th century, the Ottoman, uh, the Sultan deliberately recruited and employed deaf people because they couldn't overhear the secrets. Uh, so then, you know, couldn't even torture them to get the secrets out. And the uh, Sultan also enjoyed spending time uh, with uh, the deaf employees there. There were people with Dilsis who were these deaf attendants. And it was the case that it was almost something that other people in the court uh, would do uh, as well out of respect for the Sultan. So in that situation, a much more complex uh, sign language seems to have, have arisen. So then, uh, just another example I want to mention here is uh, Alipur Sign Language in um, southern India. So this was a Muslim community originally from Andhra Pradesh to the north, and uh, th their spoken language background was Urdu, um, and they shifted down to Karnataka, so they shifted out from the Indo-European speaking part of India to the Dravidian speaking part of India, in particular Karnataka, and they became reproduced, reproductively isolated. So there's a lot more Muslims in Andhra Pradesh than there are in Karnataka. So there were few, fewer Muslims for them to marry. Their language wasn't the language of the surrounding area, so they became more reproductively isolated. And uh, that meant that there were higher rates of congenital deafness. So that then, then uh, the, the village sign language developed there. So you can see that, that there's a whole you know, interplay of cultural, demographic, biological factors in favouring um, the development of Alipur uh, sign language. And then back in the other direction, I'll mention a, a consequence of this a bit later on today. Once you adopt a particular modality, so you adopt sign language rather than spoken language as your modality, that can feed back into linguistic structures. Because uh, one of the special things about sign language is that you can make uh, signs with two uh, signs at sign parts, two hands at once, which you can't do in speech. Right? So uh, there are certain uh, things where we, we find actually architecturally different grammatical solutions in sign language that wouldn't be easy to do in spoken language. Okay, so let's just go back now to internal selectors and I want to take reciprocal constructions as a, a sort of case study. Uh, reciprocals are such a huge topic and I know there's people here in this room who have also been interested in them for some time and I'm not going to be able to talk about the full range of reciprocal constructions, which is quite amazing, but I think they're a good place to show where it predominantly trade-offs between um, different factors which seem to give rise to the diversity.
So let's just jump back to biology for a moment uh, and what we can call fitness landscapes. So a sort of evolutionary model, I call uh, Nicholas, um, Carl, Carl Nicholas uh, has written a couple of really interesting articles on what he calls fitness landscapes. So the idea here is that in any form of evolution, you are subject to multiple selectors, and the more of those that exist, the larger the number of more or less equally efficient solutions. So if there's just one selector that you have to satisfy, it's really easy that there'll be a single optimal solution. But when there's a lot, there's a lot of ways of doing it. So he did stuff where he, you know, he would simul sim simulate the uh, radiation out of a new landscape. So, for example, uh, fish coming, uh, creatures, vertebrates coming on shore, or um, plants colonizing new ecosystems, and so on, and seeing how many things would emerge. Uh, and he got good matches between his his models and the actual biological records of what happened. So I think this is a useful concept. Uh, because we can then look at the language, at the language of grammars and say, well, for a given function, in this case we're going to see reciprocals, how many things are you having to satisfy? And it, uh, if you have to satisfy more things, uh, then you might expect to get more diversity. Now, with this, this is an idea that's been with us at the level of trade-offs for, for a long time, whether in optimality theory or in functional linguistics, as I've said, but I don't think the question of how many trade-offs do you have to satisfy and do you get different numbers of those for different constructions has been properly posed um, in the field. So if we look at reciprocal constructions, uh, they're semantically very complex uh, because you have multiple simultaneous uh, propositions. So, you know, if, if I say, you know, Alex and I visit each other or something like that, uh, we have one proposition where Alex visits me and another one where uh, I visit him. There's probably a further proposition I would say that has to do, we have some, it's a bit hard to express, but we have some agreement of reciprocation or collaboration that goes into the arrangement. It's not just two unconnected uh, propositions. So not only are you overlaying several proposition into what in English here, Alex and I visit one another is a single clause, but you've also got permutation of roles and possibly, I would argue, uh, both some transitive propositions like I visit Alex, Alex visits me, and some sort of intransitive one like you know, Alex and I collaborate or we're visiting partners or however you might want to express it. So, as we will see, this gives rise to a, a very large number of different design solutions, even though there are some very common ones among the languages of the world, but we will gravitate out into the long tail and find some, it, it is a very long tail indeed. So, as I did in previous uh, classes, uh, I apologise to people who may be in the audience who uh, wows workers or grand bank workers. Uh, I don't want to sort of downplay the significance of that, but I think it's really important just to remind ourselves constantly of how far both these enterprises underrepresent the full extent of linguistic design, the language design space. So uh, I'm going to call this underbidding. You, you'll be familiar with the sense of bidding where you've just got to decide which bin does something go into? You're sorting things out every time you put out your rubbish, you know this, right? You know, this, this goes into the compost one, this goes into the recyclables, and this goes in. You know, there's a few more bins here than in Australia, and uh, some countries, of course, just have a single bin. Uh, so, but it's essential to typology or any sort of database, you've got to decide where to put things. And if we look at what Wiles does with its reciprocals bin, uh, this is the question in Wales. Uh, there's just one question assigned to reciprocals. And first of all, there are nine 
no non-iconic reciprocal construction. So this would be a language where there's no special reciprocal thing, and I just say, I visit Alex, and Alex visits me. Um, and then the second one, all reciprocal constructions are formally distinct from reflexive construction. So just imagine a language where, uh, say, a version of English, where we take the each other construction, which is dedicated to reciprocals, and we don't have, for example, the intransitive construction like they hugged, which can be reciprocal, or you know their mutual dislike, where you uh, apply uh, you know some sort of modifier like mutual to that, or um, various prefixes like interfertile populations or things. There's there's actually a lot of different um, structural types in English. So if we just pruned it down so that the only things we had were like each other, that would go in there. And then the third type, there are both um, reflexive and non-reflexive uh, reciprocal constructions. So you would put French in, into this, right? So you know, if you say you know, il se voit, or even uh, in principle, il se vase which you normally would think of as a reflexive, but you can create contexts in which people are shaving one another and so on. So, so that has the uh, reflexive, non-reflexive, reflexive reciprocal polysemy, but you can also use you know, that or something to disambiguate and get the reciprocal. Uh, and then you have uh, the, the yellow one, reciprocal and reflexive constructions are formally identical. So everything would be of the, you know, is size type and there's lots of languages around the world you can see it's 44 and some of 175 that are like that so uh, that sounds all right and, and you can look at the map and they've got a map for that uh, but uh, how far does that actually go in uh, probing the full design space well one funny thing about it is it sort of mixes semantic criteria, like do you have polysemy between reflexives and reciprocals with structural criteria. That is, is there a distinct construction type like each other or whatever, mutual and so on. Uh, well, why choose that polysemy over others? Certainly it's widespread, but so are others. That lots of languages have commutative or associative reflexives or reflexive iteratives and a whole lot of other ones, reflect, uh, re reciprocals and competing. Uh, so you've just picked one and privileged over all the others. Uh, and then, uh, second problem, you can hold a semantic criterion constant. So let's say we'll have reflexive reciprocal polysemy uh, and various structural parameters. So in, in French, uh, if, if you say, you know, il se voit, the, the se, it, you know, it's clinic normally you would say. Um, in Dalaban, you've got a suffix, so, you know, balatnaden, the, the red mark thing there, it, it's a suffix that comes right after the, the root. Uh, and then some languages actually have reflexive reciprocal pronouns, so that in then, mabenjos uh, would mean either yourselves or very hard to render into English, something like you, each other, or something. That is, it's each other, but specified for, for you. Uh, so the typological space hasn't been properly factorized. If you're really seriously doing typology, you say, well, let's look at the semantic uh, dimension. So what are all the possible polysemies or that is dedicated? And let's look at the structural dimension. Is it realized by verbal affixes or clinics or uh, some sort of special noun phrase or whatever. Uh, and then, perhaps most importantly at all, we'll see in the next slides, there's just a huge number of other construction types which aren't well sampled by this. So the types that I'm going to be showing you just don't get captured at all uh, by this. So um, it's a really important article by Eckhart, uh, by Koenig and Kokotani. They recognised four types, and I wrote an article after this where I argue that there's at least 17 distinct types. There's way more than what uh, they argued for. So, um, why they have to cross what I'll call a big evolutionary hump? That is, there are languages that 
just don't bother to have reciprocal constructions because as we saw uh, last time, reciprocal constructions are fairly rare. They're sort of you know, less than 0.1% of the time do, do languages usually have them. So you, you're not losing much by not having them and then you just spell it out. Uh, so that is already an evolutionary pump. You like that, it's most likely to develop distinct constructional solutions to things you have to do frequently. Uh, but pr probably what's a bigger problem is the complexity of the meaning that you need to express. So if you say, you know, John and Mary love each other, you've got minimally John loves Mary and Mary loves John. Uh, so these are these sort of predicates going in opposite directions in terms of which argument is associated with subject and which with object but probably you've got a third predicate involving doing things together in a coordinated way, uh, which you might say you know, that they are in a loving relationship or however in that case. And sometimes there's sort of mutual causation. So if they're fighting each other um, or they're taking revenge upon each other, each act of revenge has a sort of feedback effect on the next one. So there's these causal links between successive um, implementations. So this all makes reciprocals a bit complex to express all that typically in a single clause. Well, are all human languages constrained by the, what we can call the predicate overlay problem? Uh, one interesting thing we I mean, said sign languages are interesting here is that we are in spoken language constrained by linearity. We've just got one signal that we have to go through. Uh, there are interesting exceptions to this in the case of super segmentals like tone or pharyngealization or whatever. So, you know, you could imagine a really cool imaginary language where you put one predicate into the segments and another into the uh, tonal pattern or something, or, or maybe a uh, Semitic type structure where you put part of it into the vowels and part of the consonants or whatever, can help you evade linearity in some ways. But sign languages are, are really nice because you've got two primary signers uh, signing um, organs. So, uh, for example, this is in Indo-Pakistani sign language, which is the world's largest sign language, has about six million signers, and has been studied by Louis Gazishin and by Sibaji Panda, who himself is a native signer. So if I say to punch, you know, I make a sign like this, which is with just one hand, but if I say to argue, I use both of them. So I've got one coming this way, one coming this way. I sort of get around the, the linearity uh, problem there. And uh, something that I haven't put a slide for, uh, but I would just like to demonstrate orally. I'm not sure how this will go for the people following the Zoom, um, or orally and manually, mm -hmm. that in almost every spoken language, if you look at the full semantic range of reciprocals, it's normally portrayed as being symmetrical, but uh, there are some non-symmetrical examples. So if you say something like, you know, the, student, the graduating students followed each other onto the stage. Um, there's a student who's in front and isn't following anybody. And there's a student at the back who isn't being followed by anybody. So it's not fully, strictly speaking, um, a, a symmetric predicate for all participants. But spoken language is just like bugger, we'll follow it, you know, we'll just extend the, that out. When we looked at in the Pakistani sign language, this was part of a project where we looked at reciprocals across languages, so we had some torturous amount of stimulus video, 64, with all sorts of things permuted, and one of them was this following thing. And in the case of um, in the Pakistani sign language, they would show that by something like this. You, know, you would have uh, the people walking along behind each other. Uh, so it was very easy to code. And that was the only language in our sample that had a distinct uh, construction type for that. So it's another example of how you have uh, affordances coming from the modality which make a particular specialised meaning possible. Now I'd like to pass to 
a couple of, depending on your point of view, either ingenious or perverse uh, solutions to the linear, linearity problem for uh, reciprocals, which end up with language doing sort of weird things as they try and, sorry to speak teleologically, but for those joining us today, I've said when I do it, I don't mean it's a deliberate thing, it's something that emerges as people try and solve other problems. Uh, so first of all, in Wajja and Mao, two um, Australian languages very closely related from uh, northwestern Arnhem Land. So uh, if we look at how you express reciprocals in these constructions, uh, first of all, just a standard transitive. So number one is from Iwaja, Gawun, is she hit him, right? So you've got a prefix ga, which is she acting upon him, then you've got wun. Right? Now, what about they two hit each other? You say Gawun la jami. So literally, she hit him and he in turn. Okay? Uh, and that jamin is also used for other things like, you know, he in turn type thing. So it's not confined to reciprocal constructions. Um, so it looks sort of elliptical, right? So something like, and he in turn hit her. But that's not really the right analysis because it has been conventionalized enough and you can put the lajamin, I'm sorry, the alignment mm -hmm. of words with glosses slipped a bit here. But I can say, for example, um, well, this is, this is what you would think in three it would come from. So, Kawun, La Jamin Riwun, right? So, she hit him and he in turn, he hit her. So, you could say that. That would be like the iconic reciprocal spelling it out. But part of the evidence for its single core status in modern Iwaja is that if you have a ditransitive, uh, uh, clause, like to give each other, you put the la jamin part before the actual object. So I can say gugong la jamin wali, right? So she gave him and he in turn food. So in terms of the order and prosodic integration and everything, that's a single clause. So then you can say which one's the subject there of that clause. Is it the one represented by the prefix on the verb, which is what we would normally say, she, or is it the he in turn? Or is it sort of both? Or should you just be a constructionalist and say there's a construction here and we associate semantics with it and you know we don't sort of worry ourselves too much about individual elements being labeled as the symbol of the subject. So uh, it's, it's a tricky uh, problem to resolve. And it's possibly the fact that it is a problem, you know, that follows from our beliefs about how to, uh, what formalisms we use to represent structures. Uh, and something else in favor of that conventionalized construction analysis is that when you have I upon you or you upon me, things get even wilder because if I say you and I gave each other food, so gunagong, gun is I acting upon you, so gunagong langabimong walet, so I acting upon you and I in turn food. Well, it should be and you in turn food, right? Because I've already done my bit as the subject. And uh, I can't say This is one of those ones where you know, you're doing a bit of a listation and you assume that you would and you say, and people just give you this little look. No, you've got to say that. So, so here you've conventionalized the fact that if you have first and second person as the reciprocating participants, the uh, sequential subject pronoun has to be the first person. But the ones on the book can be either. So it just looks like you've got uh, that uh, narrowed down. That's actually the same thing. Well, we two things making the same point, so we can uh, leave that one. So I now want to head north in Sahul up to, to New Guinea and look at another.
wild and wonderful construction from a, a trans New Guinea language called Hua, uh, described by John Heyman, and um, he made some really wonderful observations about this, I think. So this is, first of all, it's what a standard transitive course looks like. So he looked at you, the, the first part, <laughs> so in 9A, the K, which is you, that's the object, right? And in 9B, the third singular is a zero object. And then it's a sort of simply verb incorporating the subject. So gaze, he looked at, and gane is you looked at. Right? So kage is he looked at you, and gane is you looked at him. And then like lots of uh, trans New Guinea languages, um, this has a particular form of what are called sometimes well, medial forms of verbs. So you stack up a whole lot of, some people might want to call them like converbs or something, you stack them up till you get to the final verb, which gives you all of the information. But these are not standard medial forms because in some of those Highlands languages, they have what are called anticipatory verb forms where the medial form is already giving you some information about the subject of the next verb that's coming up. So that word ka is something like you object, he looked at, and ga, he medial, saying my subject of this verb is he, and then the ga is like and there's a you subject coming up in the next clause, stand by, uh, right? And then you get to the next verb, which is kind of, you looked at him, right? So there's a, it's, it's sort of like spoiler alert language where it tells you a bit about what's going to happen in the next clause. Hmm. Uh, and then in 9D, uh, just turning it back around in the other way, you looked at him, and then he looked at you, you've got kanana, so, him, you looked at, he, me, your form, and then uh, he, he is coming up as the subject of the next clause, and then could get, you looked at him. All right, so you've got this first verb, which is the medial verb with its anticipatory form, and then you get to the final form. He describes this in his, well, grammar. So and it's just like, and then X did this, and then Y did something. Well, John Heyman describes the way that this construction gets coerced in a way particular to reciprocal constructions so that sort of allows you to cheat time, allows you to get around the linearity of the uh, normal spoken language signal. Uh, so he says, rather than a conjunction of medial and final verbs, what we encounter, this is in reciprocal constructions, is a conjunction of medial clauses, each of which with its final resonance loops back and then anticipates the other. So you're sort of caught in this sort of kayak roll or death roll between <laughs> two verbs. Each one is before the other one in terms of its more morphology. So you get things like this just in reciprocal construction. So you get, if you look at 9e carefully, you've got the first word. Kagegaka, you, uh, he looked at you, and then you coming up, and then you looked at him, and then he coming up, coming back, <laughs> and then you close it all up with they two did. And so that's our intransitive. So this is what the action was involving them. So we can see this as a language where you've just happened to have a sort of little cheek creating this possibility that is, ah, oh, you've got these anticipated reforms, normally one precedes the other. Oh, well, we could, we could use that. There's an unfilled possibility here, which is to put two anticipated reforms together. When would we use that? Ah, oh, reciprocal. Boom, let's do it. Um, once again, I stress, I'm not speaking teleologically, but I'm just saying that as structures evolve, they create possibilities for uh, further use, and that's why what I was talking about in the last class about uh, seeing objects as, as languages as phenomena of the third kind, that is 
once you get to a particular structural state, as humans strive to uh, fulfill. Oh, I'm just wobbling a bit here. As they strive to fulfill uh, just the goal of communicating, uh, they often just grab on stuff. Or it could even be a speech error, but it becomes a useful speech error with serving a communicative purpose. So, putting together you know, these and loads of other anomalous, weird reciprocal constructions, I could have talked about if we had more time, uh, we, it suggests that we've got some sort of revised semantics for reciprocals that have got this sort of new joint interactive compo component. Uh, so, that motivates this sort of bi directional causation. It motivates coordinate structures with, like in English, you know, John and Mary, uh, intransitive structures, or lots of languages, lots of oceanic languages, say, where you will submit it or verbal language, or something you just put an intransitive, intransitivizing prefix on a verb or a form of a verb to, to produce a, a reciprocal. Uh, but you also get sort of mixed structures. Um, uh, for example, a lot of Australian languages, you put a reciprocal affix on a verb, it looks like it is detransitivized it, you only get a single argument, but the single argument is in the ergative. Why? You know, there's just one argument left. Uh, in some approaches, such as relational grammar, uh, Judith Asen talked about this in Mayan languages, so you sort of work through these steps of a relational grammar and an early step before they've been joined together, you assign the ergative case and then you do some other stuff and knock out one nine phrase, but the ergative case was introduced at an earlier phase. So that's an approach uh, where you try and explain the complexity through all the deviance through the representation. Uh, I view that as another sort of funny internal explanation. And I don't think linguists should do that. I don't think we should seek to explain typological facts through our representations. We should seek to explain them as possibilities that some languages do as we look across the whole spectrum. Okay. So uh, that means that we shouldn't try and derive all aspects of the meaning of uh, reciprocal constructions compositionally. There have been lots of attempts to do that. There's a huge literature on uh, reciprocals and how to get the meaning of each other to fall, fall out from each and other. In formal semantics literature, there's lots of stuff. We move stuff around also in the generative literature. But I think it can be illusory because for a start, what you do when you hit a language where that it's not how you do things, uh, but also there's missing elements of the meaning actually which aren't well handled uh, by that. So I would prefer an approach where you have uh, a construction, where you say well, this is what the construction means, and then you see constructions as motivated, but the motivation is never a 100% motivation. It's a construction that evolved as a result of a number of selective factors, but it, it's not like the selective factors totally predetermined that you would arrive at that structure any more than in one of these fitness landscapes that you know, Nicholas mentions. It is predetermined that a flying creature that has evolved wings will do it by fusing these bones rather than these bones or, or these bones. You know, there's different roads to the same realm uh, as one looks at evolutionary accounts. And I, I, this is just a hypothesis really, that um, the more complex the meaning represented is, the less likely it will be that a language can represent all aspects of that meaning directly, the more you're going to constructionalise it. And the construction will have this extra stuff. And it also gives a very special role to typology. I think that is when we look at a particular function or a particular meaning, and we look at the many ways that languages resolve it, usually each one of those is motivated, but partially motivated. And looking at the full spectrum allows us to see what the full range of internal selectors is. <laughs>
So we now pass to external selectors, which in a way is the more unfamiliar and controversial part of today, because as I've said, leaders for a long time have been in interested in um, internal selection, and you could see you know, both functionalist approaches and optimality theory as two examples of attempts to seek to explain uh, language diversity through things which are all language internal. But there's actually a long pedigree in uh, studies of language for some types of external selector. I think it's useful to distinguish what we might call Vico Herder effects, where we, where we go back to Gian Battista Vico, who was probably the first person to articulate this in a Western tradition, and then followed up not too long after by Gottfried Herder, uh, and then by, by others, there is that there's an influence of culture on language. Uh, and you know, back in the days of the sort of early Romantic period, this was phrased as, you know, each people, each nation having its own genius that's beautifully reflected by its language. And this is why nations should have their own languages and so on. So it's you could argue that the current map of Europe, you know, follows from what Gian Battista Vico wrote back in his obscure uh, part of Naples when he wrote La Scienza Nuova, you know, like this is what got people thinking, no, we can't just be all under this empire or that empire. Um, so that's been around for a while. Uh, but two things I'd like to mention are that if we believe that, then it's something that results from slow iteration over many lifetimes. That is, it takes time for languages to evolve what makes them distinctive and if they fit with their cultures in some ways. So you need certain types of evidence. They might be discourse frequency, especially if you can look at discourse frequency back through time if you've got a diachronic corpus, that's really wonderful. Um, diachronic typology, comparative population studies, we'll, we'll look at some examples of this. Many people confuse this with sort of Wolfian effects because both have to do with the sort of close connection of language and culture, but the time scale is completely different for a sort of Sapir Wolfian effect because the idea there is you know, you're born into a society as a newborn, you learn to speak a language, and somehow that language then influences how you think. So that's an effect that has happened in your lifetime and possibly more, more recently than that, possibly for some people as rapidly as moving between two languages. Uh, it, you know, there, there are some experimental studies that show that you know, in a bilingual dialogue, as you switch between two languages, that's producing these effects. So, so the time scale is somewhere between the lifetime and the conversational term, if you like. And in principle, this is available to experimental study, right? as there have been many of in the sort of, especially the, the name-making tradition of looking at effects, for example, on, of language, on spatial cognition in tasks, and, many others like that, or things looking at what's the effect of the colour vocabulary of your language on your colour perception, uh, and does having two blues like in, in Russian Sini, colour boy, train you to perceive more attentively to the boundary between those. Um, there's a lot of work on that which I'm not going to uh, talk about because it's, for me, that's after you've got the language that's different. Um, so. I'm going to focus on the, the Vika Herder effects. And in this part uh, of the uh, lecture, I'm going to look at three studies in Vikovian vein, if you like. So one is the emergence of base six uh, numeral systems in Southern New Guinea. Second is the emergence of logophoric pronouns in West Africa. And the third is the emergence of what has been called Kintax in Australian languages. So these base six numeral systems are a bit of a light motif. You'll remember that I 
mentioned this in an earlier talk, and I'm also going to mention it again tomorrow, that final connection. Uh, but they uh, are a, a unique feature of languages of Southern New Guinea centered on what's called the Yam uh, family. And uh, what's special about these is that just in the same way that in English or French or Chinese or Japanese, we have base 10 uh, numeral systems where we have, you know, 10 and 100 and 1,000. And if you speak Japanese, you know, like man, which is 10,000. And, and if you, you speak, you know, one of a number of North Indian languages, something like luck, 400,000 and core, which is 100 million or whatever it is. I mean, they're all models of 10, all the way up. And then monomorphic words. Well, these uh, Yam languages are just like that, but the monomorphic words are powers of six, not of 10. So you can see that skimming down this table. I haven't put them all in, um, but if you uh, say, take, you know, 100 or 100, uh, which is a nice simple word in English or, or uh, French, and then you want to say that in Nim, you've got to say Sombis, but that's Sombis, that's Sombis, Puss, Sombis, that's Sombis. That is two thirty-sixes and um, two plus two uh, sixes and two plus two. Uh, it's a, it's a, it just it's a bit of a weird thing here that four is two plus two. Uh, on the other hand, if you say Prata in Nim, nice chunky word, uh, in whether you say 36 or 36, it's a bit more complicated uh, in English or French. And if you say taromba in um, in um, Nen, which is 216, it becomes even more complicated in English, 216 or 26. Uh, sorry, 26. Uh, and then, sorry, I've left out a little space there. Um, and then if you go up to, for example, Weremaka, which is 7,776, nice easy word in Nen because it's simply six to the power five. Uh, but whether you say the English word or, you know, second says, so, 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 so. in French, they're pesky words, right? So you've got these sweet spots in both or all three languages, but where the sweet spots fall is different. Uh, and uh, we've got some uh, evidence from language cognition and you just know yourself that arithmetical calculations are easy when they involve the sweet spots. So if I ask you to multiply 100 by 100, you will have no difficulty at all. Whereas if I ask you to multiply 216 by 216, unless you're a special person, you immediately come up with the answer. Uh, right? Even though, if you've understood the principles, here, you can uh, immediately, well, no, that one's missing, but if I ask you to multiply 36 by 36, you can work bilingually and get back to the answer to Dumnum. Dumnum, yeah, which is 1,296. So, so, there, so these things do uh, oil the grooves of particular sort of cognitive practices. So in Nen, it goes up to 6 to the 5th. There are some other languages that go up to 6 to the 6th. So. Six to the sixth is we. I mean, how's that for a small, comfortable, monomorphemic uh, word uh, in some other languages of this family? Well, these are the only languages in the world that have powers of six. There are some others where six is a sort of unit in low numbers, but and so how the hell did that arise? Still, people have five digits on the hands. They're not like Simpson figures with you know, six digit hands or anything. Um, well, this is a really interesting question. And um, this was first described by an anthropologist uh, who wrote a book called Papuans of the Trans Fly in the 1930s, uh, Williams. He was the Australian government anthropologist to uh, the territory of Papua in those days. Uh, and he described the processor, rather than putting his prose in, I want to show you a video because um, where I work, I haven't actually witnessed a traditional yam counting ceremony, but uh, Christian Dula, who did his PhD on a closely related, or another language of this family, Konzo, uh, was there 
when a um, traditional yam counting ceremony took place. So this is the, the primary use of these numbers is to tally up yams, which is done once a year. It's like harvest time. It's done in public. It's sort of like counting the votes in Florida or somewhere. You know, everyone gathers around, there's scrutineers, everyone's making sure you don't, because your worth as a human being flows from how good a gardener you are. You can boast about, you know, I grew more yams than hikes or whatever. And he can challenge me, he can say I'm a worthless person. I say, come on, you know. So, so it's really culturally important. And everyone puts together their yam harvests uh, and then there's public counting. Uh, and I should also say that there are sort of things like certain ceremonies should, you should give you know, two purta of yams to your sister or your brother in certain ceremonies and a family household should have a domino of yams to get itself through the year. So if you don't have a domino of yams in your yam house, the end of the harvest, you worry that you face famine and so on. So there's lots of important cultural things based on these. So uh, I'm gonna play it in a second, uh, but I just want to explain a little bit the logic so you know what to look out for. So essentially, you've just got an undifferentiated pile of yams, and then two counter men come in and each transports three yams, which they're holding, together, so three each, and they put them down as a little pile of six. Now, if you've ever worked as a student waiter or waitress, you know it's easy to carry three cappuccinos in your two hands. You have one in each and one in the middle. So it's a bit like this, that's how you carry the two yams, the three yams. Um, and then each time that six is put down, there's another guy who's counting it all out and beating a drum, and he's like, one, one, and he goes, one, two, two. And each time he's saying like two, he means the second lot of six, and then the third lot of six. And then you get up to the sixth lot of six, and that's the moment when you will see, just watch really carefully, uh, someone pulls out a single counting yam from this pile of six sixes, that is 36, and starts a second thing. So it's a little bit like an abacus, right? Like a sort of giant human abacus with four people doing every stuff, all the stuff. Uh, and that then generates the next count of the powers of the second powers of six. And then you iterate that, which I'm not going to show because it gets too complicated. One thing you'll notice is that they didn't actually call out the word which means 36 that? Yeah. Yeah. that was implicit yeah. in the procedure and we haven't quite figured out what the etymology of that word for 36 is but it looks like it means so that Mark uh, Donahue wrote an article where he claimed that he had it meaning something else but it was like second or something and it's like the second time around so, uh, and it looks like it's based on, but it's prata, but it looks like put is an alternate of pus, which is hand. Uh, so, but there's some funny things there we won't go into, but the, the most important point I want to say now is that here we've got our Vicovian claim that there's the peculiarities of a local counting practice, yan tally. It's a non-linguistic thing, apart from the fact that it's calling stuff out. That involves some environmental factors, so the shapes of the yams, how, how many you can put in your hands, just presumably, for whatever reason, at some point they just evolved this ritual of having two people. Like they could have had three or four or just one. Uh, and so that's a sort of cultural habitus. And then the tallying algorithm, the way it's pulled out, and the fact there's one that's pulled out, those were all key elements of cultural selection, which then ended up generating a base six and powers of base six, six tallying system. Now, for the moment, I'm saying a particular numeral system uh, and just take that as something that's not 
demonstrated actually, because um, Rafael Nunez has been peppering me about this and saying, well, I don't think you should call that a numeral system. A tallying system isn't the same as a numeral system. Because if this is if the only time you use these words is in that context, mm. they're not actually numerals, right? They're just things you say at particular moments. So tomorrow I will return to this point and look at how in a multilingual context, the graduation from maybe tallies to numerals can be seen to be taking place under our eyes. So this is just like part of our demonstration. Can you count other things than yams with this system? That's what I'll talk about okay. tomorrow. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So, so this example is neutral about that, right? Yeah. yeah. Oui, en français, on utilise we use 36. Il y en a pas 36. Yeah, I know that's very interesting that you say that in yeah. French and not in English. We don't use it in the same way. But 36 has a bit of a special yes. status. But you don't say 216 as far as I know. <laughs> yeah. Not yet. Or 236. 107 ans. 107, we have. 107, oui. It's another thing. Yeah. So that, I, I don't know if anyone knows about the history of why 36 is so. I mean, of course, we have dozens in English, you know, two dozen, three dozen, and so on. Yeah. But it's not quite like the salient as tonsis in French. So now I'm going to pass to my next little Vicodian exhibit, uh, which has to do with a lot of foreign pronouns in uh, West Africa, in languages like Ebe, although this is an example from, I don't know, from saying the language name properly, Argem, or something like this. Uh, and you will all know, I'm sure, that the cool thing about logophoric pronouns is that they resolve an ambiguity present in English. So if I just said he said that he fell or she said that she fell, it's ambiguous. Like she might have said, I fell, or she might have said, she fell, right? And they get pushed together in English or French. Uh, and even if you say, you know, the woman said that she fell, it's the same thing. Uh, but in the systems of logophorics, you've got uh, one, which in this case, on the left-hand side, you've got all, which is really she. So what the woman said was, she fell. One woman's talking about another one, woman falling. Um, and in the second one, you've got a logophoric, which is a she who is in an I, if you like. The woman said, I fell. Right? So these are really cool things that you can have as part of pronoun systems. Uh, I like to see these as sort of biperspectival, that is, you concurrently reckon the dating value with respect to the primary speech act and the reported speech act, or you know, you can look at these in various forms of syntactic formalism as well. Um, but the question is, well, why do you get them where you do get them in, in Balthasar's Bickle's formulation? You know, what's where, why? Um, about that's what topology is about. Um, and uh, I won't say that only found in West Africa, I mean, they. They're not super common, but they're found elsewhere in the world. But um, Felix and Maker wrote a really uh, beautiful article about this called Grammar and Cultural Practices, in which he points out that widespread in West Africa is a whole cluster of cultural practices where you have mediated communication. So it could be like a chief sending off some minion to tell someone else uh, what they said. Or it could be a parent sending off a child to a neighbour to say what it said, but this huge value placed on faithful transmission of messages and faithful reporting. And uh, so maybe the meaner sends me off you know, to tell someone what to do. Uh, and then, you know, I've got to show up and say, you know, and then Amina said, and then I've got to reproduce her words. Uh, and the point is, do I keep saying at every um, sentence, I mean, to say to frame it, or at some point, you know, I'm saying uh, I'm interested in phonology or whatever, uh, and then the, the speaker might, the addressee might wonder, well, is this a, did it mean to say that, or, or I had a messenger 
sort of interjecting my own view. And uh, Paul Leger actually wrote an early article about this, and he had this example of a really, really long quoted passage uh, where you didn't keep framing it with so-and-so said. So at some point, you're reliant on the logophores to indicate that it's the source of the, of the that, that someone else is the source of the material. So you could argue this, that here we've got a particular cultural practice that favours the emergence of um, logophoric pronouns. Now, this is just something that's what you might call, you know, anecdotal evidence or a just-so story. I don't think there's been uh, something that you could think of as a, a rigorous attempt to test this out, and we can think about what that might involve. It would probably need to involve, you know, careful typological survey, well sampled across a whole lot of different cultures of the world, some of which have languages with logophoric pronouns and some which don't, and also a concomitant set of data about the prevalence or otherwise of those sort of messenger or emissary practices, uh, which depends on a type of anthropology that believes you should be getting cross-culturally compatible data. That's something which anthropology used to believe in. And you have things like the human relations area files uh, that did that. But sadly, it doesn't really believe in comparability anymore. So that's an enterprise that has sort of, at least temporarily, taken a bit of a halt in anthropology, although that there's um, this really great resource called D-Place. I don't know if you know about this which has uh, a lot of things like that. I'm not, I haven't checked actually to see whether they talk about uh, this particular phenomenon. So can we relate the grammaticalization of kinship categories in Australian languages and a few others in the world to different patterns in what speakers do uh, most frequently? So um, here's uh, Joan Bybee, who has been one of the people who's written the most about how repeated patterns uh, become part of grammar in terms of ritualization. Uh, and this has just been a huge focus of sort of functionalist approaches in, in linguistics that you know, automatization, habituation, and so on go on into grammaticalization. Uh, the sort of assumption has been well, you can look in any language and see what goes on. This is how we form perfects, or this is how we grammaticalize plurals or pronouns, whatever they are. Um, there hasn't really been within the functionalist approach something that you could say a culturally differentiated uh, approach. That is, what if in different cultures people do different things more often? Uh, if you go back to what Jack Dubois said, grammars code best what speakers do most. I would actually say it's better to say what speakers did most because it takes a while for that to get into the system. But it does open the possibility that different speakers will do different things most. So that they ended up with different grammars. But that wasn't Dubois' uh, approach. So can we find evidence that speakers of Australian languages make more frequent use of kinship references? I think anyone who's worked with Australian languages is blown away by the fact that that's how you talk about people all the time uh, and just need to work that out before you can do anything else in the community, but can we actually quantify it? And I think I didn't put this or I absolutely lost a reference to a really nice paper by James Simpson about this in Nick Enfield's edited volume on ethnosyntax and Jane puts uh, a number of sort of steps that one should follow through before doing this and she applies it to different semantic domain that is what's called associated to motion in, in Walbury. So she shows that people talk about you know, certain sorts of motion and that's probably why it grammaticalizes. But we've been uh, trying to apply this, um, I guess, look at comparative uh, frequency uh, in our scopic project to try and help with uh, this problem. So here's Daniel Bath, 
uh, who co-leads the Scopic project that stands for the Social Cognition Parallax Interview Corpus. And the idea here is that we really want to see how speakers of different languages talk about similar situations. Uh, what we do is a little bit like the pair story or something that is you know, getting parallel data, but it's a problem solving task. So we have to give people 16 pictures and they have to construct a story. They're free to do it. And two reasons for doing that is it gets people more emotionally involved. So it makes them more agentive in the process. And second, that because there are phases of the task, so the first phase is just describing the pictures one at a time. The second is two people discussing the order. So you get lots of imperatives and questions like, put that card here. And do you think this is the same person as this one? And uh, then you get a third person narrative, is telling the story, and then a first person narrative pretending to be one of the characters. So you get a lot of genre types inside the same time. And we have this data from about 30 languages. But we can now start to do a, we're saying parallax corpus rather than parallel corpus, because it's not exactly parallel. But, uh, and we think that that's better because a real parallel corpus, you've got some founding language that then gets translated and we think that can distort uh, things very heavily because however, whatever the formulation in the founding language, will favour its reproduction in the other. So we think it's very important to let people um, find their own ways to express it. So with this parallax corpus, um, one of the things we've done and got figures for is how people formulate reference to individuals. So if you have a picture of a person or more than one person, there's lots of different ways you could say. You could say, you know, the tall guy or you could say the policeman, or you could say the Maori, or you could say that one there, or you could say the dad, right? I mean, there's, the, or you could say his dad. So the last two are sort of kinship examples, an absolute one and a possessed one, but there's many other ways of, of referring to it. So um, there, I don't know how well you can see that, uh, there down the bottom right, but our model here, it's a sort of modified Vicovian model, if you like. We've got culture uh, and then individuals sort of internalize the culture through the language. They make individual expressive choices in, in particular utterances. They're not like totally determined by the language, but it might push them a little way. And then that plays out in usage uh, frequency. Uh, which then uh, involves lexical formulation uh, and may end up through the sort of baby like frequency effects uh, affecting what the grammar is. And then that might feed back into internalized language. So uh, we've got an article that should appear really soon in a special issue on cor corpus typology of small languages uh, that gives this data and, and this data is drawn from that article. So if we just look at some of the languages in that corpus, we, like I said, we've got about 30 from every continent, uh, but here is uh, some of them. And we look at when people formulate reference to uh, individuals, this is one of the scenes it's a, it's a fairly heavy story that we've got because we wanted people to get emotionally involved and it involves sort of alcohol and domestic violence and other stuff. But for many people, they take it as a sort of moral story because like at the end, after, you know, we bad stuff and go to jail, the guy comes out and he's a reformed man and here are his sleazy old mates trying to you know, lure him back to drink with him again and saying, no, no, I'm with my son now. Do that stuff anymore. Uh, so this is that scene. Uh, and just looking at the two characters on the right, you could, for example, refer to them as the man and the boy, which lots of people did in some languages. 
of Germans, for example, were more likely to say that in one of their languages. Or you could say the father and son, or even a dyad, you know, the father-son pair or something. Uh, and no one gave, gave any of the speakers any instructions here that said the father and the son. This is all based on their choices about how to describe the story. So here we've got frequencies between, between you know, how people do things. It's, they don't correspond in any direct way to frequencies because this is a sort of uh, special multivariate model. But what you can see, if you look at the top right-hand side, is Dalai is like right up there. That's the language where people are going to town formulating things in terms of kinship relations and other uh, languages like this, so that's Auslan down the bottom, so Australian Sign Language or other uh, West African languages have as much, much less. Okay, so there we, that's a, a sort of example of how you can seek to relate the emergence of particular morphosyntactic categories to discourse frequency if you have cross-linguistic uh, data of this type. So now I want to talk about some other types of external selectors, the ones I was talking about so far, those three cases were sort of culture as a selector, which is what Vico was interested in, of course. But there's some other uh, types of selectors that I want to uh, deal with now. So uh, one is population genetics. And uh, it had been suggested, you know, right back to Von Bless in, in 1990, 1902, that some of the diversity in uh, languages' sound system might reflect inter, inter population differences in vocal tract. Um, at the time, people dismissed it and it was seen as a racist claim, uh, but also there was a sort of common sense counter argument that people from any background, any uh, race, if you like, if they're raised from birth speaking a language, they just speak it with a perfect accent. We know that. So people argue, said, well, obviously it's not true because people from any uh, population can learn to speak a language without any accent. But the, that uh, ignores the fact that we're talking here about how a system evolves, which is a different question to how an individual learns something. And it's always harder to evolve something than to learn it. The first time is always the hardest time. Um, and if you are talking about the iterated effects of hundreds of generations of learning, you can nudge an evolutionary trajectory in a particular direction with a very, very slight uh, difference between populations. So this uh, issue really was revived um, with a paper by Dan Denu, Denu and, and Robert Ladd, which I'll come to in a second, but first of all, just here's a, this is a sort of model of what uh, we're talking about when we're talking about external selectors here. So this is, I mentioned um, Christensen and Chater's uh, work in a previous uh, talk, and the idea is that these, there are these bottlenecks uh, which have to do at the bottom with the time scale of the utterance, that is, I have to process it in very rapid time, both hearing it and producing new utterance, and then the individual has to learn that through the years of learning a language, but you can only learn stuff that you've processed in the instant, in the uh, instant anyway. And that, that then gets replicated over many hundreds of generations. So you can sum up quite small biases, and from the uh, bottom, there's a talk given by Dan Vinny on Saturday, actually. Uh, this is from a photo of his slide, we produced with his permission. Uh, so you've got um, individual genotypes, let's say. Uh, we'll talk about what they are, but these are two genotypes that have been implicated, or were originally implicated, in uh, making it easier to learn or evolve um, tone languages. Uh, and then you've got individual weak biases. So some individuals have this gene, some don't. It, it's easier for certain people to produce and learn and learn and, and decode this sound. And then there's cultural amplification. 
according to the number of such individuals in a population as they communicate with one another and then finally this gets into the language itself as an evolved system. So um, here's the original study that came out in some time ago, now 2007, by uh, Bedou and Lad. And what they did was to look at genetic, two genetic features. So um, the two uh, alleles and uh, there was data about the proportion of those alleles in the uh, number of populations, 49 populations, and then they looked at a whole bunch of linguistic features using whales, and the whales uh, they, they, they included was tone. And what they found was that there's a strong correlation between two different alleles and the presence of tone as a familiar property of language. Uh, and they proposed that it could be causal, that is, uh, certain alleles can bias language acquisition or processing, or we would say both probably, mm -hmm. but we've got the sort of more some chain model, and thereby influence the trajectory of language change through iterated cultural transmission. Okay, so this is a really important paper in terms of you know breaking the taboo, I would say, on external selection. Uh, and there's been a lot of follow-up on, on this. Uh, so two really recent papers, one uh, done in Hong Kong uh, by um, Wong et al, and uh, just published last year. So he actually took 400 Cantonese speakers and looked at their genetic profiles and gave them tests of, of tonal perception. And interestingly, he found that there was correlation of uh, ASPM was one of those two alleles that had been in, uh, implicated in the original study. Uh, so over those speakers, there was um, evidence linking that. So that's at an earlier level than evolving, or, but it also shows you that you can evolve a system. It doesn't mean that an allele is possessed by 100% of the population. Uh, so he just found it for ASPM, uh, and then uh, the earlier study had two alleles, so the other one was sometimes called microcephala and MCPH1, uh, and then did you went back and looked at a new sample uh, with an updated data set, 129 populations, re-examined it and found that it was just one of the alleles that appeared to be, uh, appeared to be implicated. That's the ASPM one, the one showing up in the Cantonese study. So it looked like the other one was a false positive. So he's very, very recently uh, published something revising that. Okay, so it just shows that you, know, you have to go through a number of steps to uh, come up with a really persuasive picture here. Now the same gang, basically, uh, Dan Bidu and other uh, collaborators has been looking at a number of other features of perception or production and their impact on um, you know, why do we get the sounds we do in the populations that have them? Is it just random? You know, could there be a world in which, uh, let's say, clicks were found in Australian languages or in you know, West European languages and where uh, typical Australian phonologies were found in Southern Africa or whatever? Or, or is there some reason why the phonologies we have are found where they are. So uh, they, so this was like Dan Didu, Scott Moisik and others uh, did this really interesting study where you look at palate shape, including data about typical palate shape among speakers of Khoisan languages. And then they did modeling of the amount of articulatory effort that goes into producing uh, clicks according to the palette shape, so they built these sort of complicated simulations, 
and they showed that if you've got the palate shape typical of a population, a Khoisan population, it's much less articulated effort to produce a click than if you've got a palate shape that probably any one of us has. So that then makes it easier for um, such a system to evolve. Or you could argue back in the other direction, it might make it more deleterious for an individual speaking uh, from one of those communities to have a mutation and transmitted mutation uh, that makes it harder for them to produce clicks. Uh, it could be more socially damaging. So these, that's another study in the same sort of realm of here are population factors which are genetic and it favours particular things involving. Something a little bit different to that, you have your articulatory apparatus. Part of it is genetically determined, but part of it is determined through your lifetime. That is what you do through your lifetime, which depends on culture, demography, and so on, uh, that can shape it. So then the question comes up, uh, do, does our life, our diet, uh, affect the structure of our jaw in particular, whether we have overbite or not? And there was a claim originally formulated by Charles Hockett that uh, people who are hunter-gatherers have to eat you know, basically tougher food uh, than people who are agriculturists and people can boil and soften their food mm -hmm. uh, and you therefore uh, use your teeth in a different way as you deal with it, which then produces a different degree of overbite, which then affects the relative uh, ease of having a true... Uh, bilateral fricative, like a foot or a vert, as opposed to a labial dental fricative, like a foot or a vert. Um, so then they went out there and looked at the relative uh, distributions of the you know, labial dentals and bilabial fricatives among hunter-gatherers and food producers, you can see on the right-hand side, and found that there were strong correlations of hunter-gatherers uh, much more likely to have bilateral fricatives, and uh, food producers are much more likely to have labial dental fricatives. Uh, and as well as that, they went back and looked at the evolution of sounds in, in the European and others, and found that evidence that moves from the uh, moves towards labial dental fricatives became more common for a time as, as people. At a softer diet. So this was an argument they put which is by um, Blasi and others uh, seeming to, to argue for an impact. And this is ultimately another type of culture, right? like food producing culture, influencing your uh, sound system. So just uh, two more slides to go. Uh, so this is another type of external selection that is, does the physical environment that uh, you live in have some effect on what's an evolvable phonological system? So Caleb Everett, son of Dan Everett, uh, has argued that the evolution of ejectives uh, is favoured by living in high elevations. Uh, so he did a study. His claim isn't quite right. That is, he, he claimed that um, all uh, major elevated areas of the world have languages in them with ejective consonants. Uh, he neglected the New Guinea highlands, which is you know, pretty high, like the world's glaciers closest to the equator. Uh, but apart from that, and I don't think you have to see these things as deterministic, um, but apart from that, it's true you know, whether you're looking at the Caucasus or, or the Andes or so on, uh, you, you know, these are independent developments and concomitantly there's low incidence of ejectives at lower altitudes uh, or in Highlands, Ethiopia, another example. Uh, so the, uh, the claim is that you've got an associated decrease in ambient air press pressure 
that reduces the physiological effort required for the compression of air in the pharyngeal cavity. And um, he also says there's a secondary cause, which is to reduce water vapour loss, you know, because it's very easy to lose water vapour in high in environments. And then he clubbed in with another group, um, Damian Blassi and Sean Roberts, to argue in another paper that I'm just summarising very briefly that complex tones are less likely to evolve in our environments. So, you know, one more um, thing of this type. Uh, so, if we just summarise what I've talked to today about selectors, I think it's helpful to think of what the null hypothesis would be, uh, and that would be that any language could evolve with equal probability in any culture, society, demographic setting, climate, lifestyle, or genetic setting. It's only a coincidence that, you know, French evolved in France and not in China, and the, the Mandarin evolved in China and not here, and so on for many others. Um, do we want to argue that? I would say that that's actually an implicit assumption of a lot of uh, linguistics, at least core linguistics, not since the beginning of time in language studies, I think, Arguments that languages reflected their cultures used to be much more common, but they've actually been pushed down. Um, so both generative work and typological work have tended to see this. People readily can see the, no, the lexicon. Of course, we're not talking about the lexicon. You know, that it's easy to culturalise. But apart from that, you, uh, there's a line drawn. Uh, then we can talk about internal factors. And of course, when I say internal factors, I mean language internal, which by definition are sort of neutral to those other factors. And they can get us a long way. Uh, and the reciprocals example was there uh, to show that. Uh, you get trade-offs between lots and lots of systems because languages are complex systems. Uh, and yeah, they can get a long way, but there's still, uh, a large part of the world's language diversity unaccounted for, uh, possibly unaccountable for, uh, in that way. And then that means we have to see a significant part of the world's linguistic diversity. We don't know how much. For me, this is like a key challenge for our field in the coming decades to see how far we need to adopt models that allow for external selectors to play a role. And those studies I was talking about, they're just examples of methodologies or studies uh, that are arguing in that direction. I'm not saying that any of them are perfect examples because I think it's like any field when people are just venturing out into new territory, uh, there's lots of methodological shortcomings and, and we need to return to those. Some will probably fall by the wayside when it's subjected to greater scrutiny, but I think there's an interesting sort of upswell of studies of this type that allow for external selectors to play a role. At the moment, our clearest examples come from phonetics at the one end and from semantics at the other, and maybe just getting into a few grammatical categories that do directly reflect semantics like syntax or logophorics or numerals. But what about core syntax? Is that going to sort of survive as something that's neutral with respect to external selectors? That's an open question for, for the future. I think, you know, you might want to say that since it bro it's the sort of broker between the form system and the meaning system, it's a bit more flexible, but I, I think we don't know the answer yet. That's all I wanted to say for today. Thank you. So please, if you have questions in the Zoom, you can ask them in the chat box and we can uh, mm -hmm. ask Nick. Yeah. But here in the room, first, perhaps. Alex? Uh, yeah, thanks, Nick. 
maybe I want to play devil's advocate. Um, so, so you, you've you've, uh, you've pleaded for acknowledging some external selectors, influence of culture, and so on uh, on on a structure of language, structures of language, and uh, many of your examples are convincing. But of course, what would you? I mean, I'm trying to think of other uh, claims that could be made. You know, some languages encode gender. Does this mean that you know these uh, these come from civilizations that where gender is more important? Uh, you know, uh, there's in in oceanic languages you usually don't have gender encoded at all in in the pronouns and anything, and yet the culture has you know constant contrast between what the women are, are supposed to do, what the men should be doing, and so on. Uh, same question for duals, you know. We could do a, a walls map, a map of what languages encode dual as opposed to plural, and many languages do and many languages don't. Are we going to, to, to say, well, probably the languages that encode duals have lots of activities that are done by pairs of people as opposed to I, I'm not sure how far we can go there. Yeah, no, I wouldn't. I'm, I certainly wouldn't want to say that uh, it is the best account, right? I mean, I, I think what we have to do as linguists now is that every typological difference that exists between languages, we should have a concomitant question, well, what's the explanation mm. for that, right? Uh, uh, you know, like like one type of explanation for ocean, the absence of gender in oceanic might be the sort of Galton's problem explanation that proto-oceanic didn't have gender, so just you know you just keep doing things the way uh, you did. So that's also a very potent factor in the distribution of the things across and needs to be controlled for. In it. Or there's the sort of naive cultural thing that you know this is a culture that treats gender importantly, or you'll know the old Geoffrey Heath article that sees gender, argues that gender has nothing to do with gender. Gender is a sort of anaphoric sorting device that partitions things into sets and therefore makes it easy to refer back to them because you know which one you're referring back to and so on. So that would be a sort of internal type of factor. Uh, those are all possible explanations. Um, could be a very interesting thing to mm -hmm. address, but the, tr the trouble with that and with a lot of these is that the relevant moment at which um, frequency effects would have operated is way in the past. Mm -hmm. If we're talking about Proto-Indo-European gender or you know, in Indo-European gender, the decisive frequency effects would be those that would have occurred seven, eight, ten thousand 10,000 years ago, and we don't have the sort of evidence we need to look at frequency things. So um, with that Dalmon data, a, a sort of counter-argument against that would be, well, how do you know that people spoke like that, you know, at the time when these things were being formed, and that, that